Um, all right, hey everyone, welcome to the June Rust Meetup. Um, as always, uh, thanks Mozilla for hosting and the food and stuff. Um, next month, we will probably be in Stanford, um, maybe. Uh, the, the meetup's still being put together, but like, like I said a couple meetups ago, we're thinking about moving it ar around so that more people can come easier and like it's good. And also, it's easier if I don't have to organize every meetup. Uh, that way I don't make mistakes like July. Um, all right, um, just one quick announcement. The Rust book is now in stores. This is the... This is the one that's online, but you can get a paper copy as well. Um, this is the one by Steve and Carol. So yeah, that's the first print copy, I guess. Like Steve had it a few weeks ago and now it's like out for everyone. So yeah, you can grab a copy on Amazon or No Starch Press or somewhere. I don't know, you can find it. It's not hard. Uh, yeah, so today we have two talks. We have Sanjay talking about coherence and chalk. And we have Rafe talking about data-oriented GUI in Rust. So I'll hand it over to Sanjay. OK. Do we have slides? Wonderful. Awesome. So hi, everybody. Uh, so as Manish said, I'm Sanjay. I actually only started working at Mozilla a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working on this project called Chalk. Uh, Chalk is the new trait system implementation uh, in Rust-C. And my research mainly focuses on modeling coherence in Chalk. Uh, don't worry if you don't know what coherence is. I'm actually going to talk about it uh, as I go along. So I'm going to start this talk by talking about uh, talking a bit about what chalk actually is. Uh, then I'll go into coherence and what that means in the context of the Rust programming language. Uh, after that, I'll talk a bit about logic programming and cover how we lower Rust code uh, into logic in chalk. Uh, finally, we'll talk about two parts of coherence: the orphan check and the overlap check. And I'll finish the talk with a summary and some final thoughts. So let's start with chalk. Um, there we go. So, sorry about that. There we go. So chalk is the uh, is, is like I said the new traits implementation in Rust. But here's how the current Rust compiler looks at about ten thousand feet. So the compiler takes your Rust code and runs it through some very cool stuff in the current traits implementation, and then eventually, after a couple more steps, outputs machine code. <laughs> Chalk is the new traits implementation. It uses logic programming, and the idea is that we can take the logical rules that the trait system abides by and represent them with logic programming. Now, I'll tell you more about logic programming in a little bit, but for now, let's talk about the part of the Rust trait system that I'm personally focusing on. Um, coherence is all about making sure that there's only a single implementation of uh, any given uh, trait uh, that applies to any method call at a given time. So it's responsible for a lot of the really cool properties that our trait system has that other languages actually don't have. So what that means is that if you call the fav method from the favorite color trait, we want to match that to exactly one implementation of that method. We want to make sure that you can't actually even define two possible implementations of a method for the same types. Fundamentally, coherence means that no matter what, given a trait and some set of type parameters, there should be exactly one impl that applies. This is important because if we have this property, then no matter where your traits methods are called, you can be sure that the behavior will be exactly as you expect. And Rust's coherence guarantees actually apply across traits as well. So even if you add a dependency to your project, it's important for that dependency uh, to never be able to introduce a conflicting implementation of any trait. <clears throat> 
coherence enables Rust and Karga to actually do a lot of really cool things. Uh, Rust is able to allow multiple distinct versions of crates in the dependency tree of your project. We avoid what's known as the hash table problem where different underlying impulses are selected for the same operation in different contexts. You can imagine that if uh, a different implementation of hash was chosen for insert versus when you were getting something from the hash table, that would cause a lot of problems. So coherence makes it so that we can never split the ecosystem by having multiple incompatible implementations of the same types in two different crates. Crates are able to maintain backwards compatibility and add impulse without increasing their major version number every time. If some other crate could implement methods for your types, uh, this just wouldn't be possible. An often requested feature in Rust is specialization. And the only reason specialization is actually possible in Rust is because coherence makes it so that there's only a single choice for a method's implementation at any given time. If two crates that are compiled separately could have overlapping implementations, uh, then we wouldn't be able to implement specialization. So coherence means that for any given trait, there are either zero or one impulse of that trait that apply to a given set of types. No more than that. That means that the my trait foo method here maps to just one implementation. Coherence also means that for every impulse that could exist, it only exists in one place. And this is key for having a coherent system. In this example, that means that only one crate has the power to define this impl of my trait for any type t. If you'd like to learn more about coherence and hear the things I described in much more detail, uh, Boats, who's known as Without Boats on GitHub and Twitter, gave a fantastic talk at a meetup uh, last year, which covers coherence in detail. So how does the Rust compiler enforce coherence? Well, coherence is implemented as the combination of two checks, the orphan check and the overlap check. The orphan check is designed to ensure that every impl abides by the orphan rules, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, this check is what gives us the property that every impl exists in only one place. The overlap check makes sure that every pair of impulse can never apply to the same set of types. This check allows us to guarantee that there is only up to one impulse of a trait for a given set of types. The orphan check goes through each impulse in the current program and tests to make sure that it abides by the orphan rules. Now, there are actually a lot of different sources about the orphan rules, and I definitely suggest you check some of these out if you're interested in learning more. But when it comes to the Rust compiler and the Rust language in general, uh, the most authoritative source is often actually the source code of the Rust compiler. So uh, let me show you some of the files and functions where the orphan rules are implemented. There's the orphan checker, which actually describes how Rust-C goes through each impl in order to check it. There are the orphan check and orphan check trait ref functions that actually do the heavy lifting of checking that an impl satisfies the orphan rules. And while we don't actually have enough time to dive into the code for each of these functions, what I've done is I've gone through them and extracted the orphan rules exactly as they're implemented in Rust-C today. So here, without any further ado, are the orphan rules according to the source code of the Rust compiler. Ta-da! Now, this is actually, this is a whole bunch of words, and it's written to be very precise. You know, it's written to be a, a very precise mathematical definition uh, of the orphan rules. And originally, when I was designing this talk, I tried uh, reading them out loud. And it turns out that reading math out loud is a terrible way to <laughs> explain things. And it's literally impossible to understand. So we're actually going to skip all of this. And I'm going to explain the orphan rules in a, a much more visual way that I hope will be easier to understand. So the orphan rules are centered around impulse. An impulse describes the implementation of a trait uh, for a given type. And impulse can have zero or more type parameters, and the trait itself can also have zero or more type parameters. 
One thing I've done, which is going to come in handy later, is I've labeled the implemented type as P0 and labeled the type parameters of the trait as P1 to Pn. Now let's talk about why I did that. So the orphan rules start by asking whether the trait we're implementing is defined in the current crate or if it comes from a dependency and is thus an upstream trait. If the trait is locally defined in the current crate, the orphan rules say that it's good to go and we can implement it for any type at all. But if the trait is an upstream trait, then the orphan rules say that we need to check a few more things. The first thing we have to check is that there's at least one type from P0 to Pn that's locally defined in the current crate. Part of the definition of the orphan rules is that we actually start searching from the implemented type and then go through each type parameter in the trait in order. I labeled those types from P0 to Pn so it's easy for us to remember to do that. Once we have a local type, we check each type before that and make sure that it doesn't contain any of the type parameters T, U, V, etc. If all of this can be verified, the impl is valid and we can continue. But if any of these steps fail, the impl is considered an orphan impl and it's disallowed by the orphan rules. So if these rules seem kind of strange and arbitrary, it's because they sort of are. Um, and the resources I linked to earlier go into the history and the reasoning behind them, and they talk about why they work towards our goal of having exactly one place uh, where an impl can belong. But for now, just try to keep these rules in mind because we'll come back to them later and talk about how they get implemented with logic programming and chalk. The other part of coherence in Rust is the overlap check. This goes through all pairs of impuls and checks for any overlap between them. The tricky part about this is that it, in order to enforce coherence, we have to be able to check all possible impuls in the entire universe. In other words, we need to be able to check any impuls that could exist in any compatible world. And the reason that we're only interested in impulse in semver compatible worlds is because if we tried to just support everything, our rules would be way too restrictive. Okay, so that's a lot of information. Uh, let's take a break from coherence and talk about logic programming. So in logic programming, the idea is that given some facts and some rules about those facts, we can come to conclusions by proving things based on what we know. Take, for example, the sentence, Sanjay loves cake. I'm Sanjay, I love cake, right? This is a fact, and I can write this in emojis like this. Uh, cake is pretty sugary, so if I enjoy cake, well, it might be reasonable to think that I enjoy candy as well. We can write this as a general rule uh, using emojis like this. Notice how I've left a placeholder to represent that this rule applies to anyone who loves cake. This is a general rule that says that blank loves candy if they love cake. We can take this fact and this rule and use them to derive the conclusion that Sanjay loves candy. We took the rule that says that someone loves candy if they love cake and used the fact that Sanjay loves cake to come to the conclusion that Sanjay loves candy. And I can tell you from personal experience, both of these things are true. <laughs> So th this is provable because we can logically derive it from the rule we created using the fact that I love cake. Chalk's uh, logic programming language is actually based on an extended form of a well-established logic programming language called Prolog. Uh, if we wanted to represent the same logic we showed before with emojis, we might write something like this in Prolog. Uh, here we've represented the same fact that Sanjay loves cake, but we've put the loves part on the outside and the Sanjay and cake parts on the inside. It still represents that same sentence, it just uses a different syntax. Uh, previously we were using the heart emoji to represent when someone loves something. Here we defined a predicate uh, using the word loves to represent the same thing and after that line uh, that represents Sanjay loves cake, we even have the same rule about candy that we had before. 
The colon followed by a dash is how you represent the word if in prologue. So just like before, this rule reads as T loves candy if T loves cake. T is a variable uh, that represents anything that could be placed there. Now, if we ask whether Sanjay loves candy, the answer that Prolog produces is yes. This is the same conclusion we came to before, and Prolog has reached it in a similar way by using our facts and our rules to prove the answer to our question. Chalk's logical language is actually even more powerful than Prolog on its own. Chalk supports a number of interesting features such as for all and exists. And for all means that a given rule is provable for all values of the variable t, whereas exists means that a given rule is provable for at least one value of the variable t. This allows us to express things like each type t implements my trait or that there is at least one type T that implements my trait. Okay, so now that we know some basic parts of logic programming, let's talk about how Chalk takes your Rust program and turns it into logic. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Chalk is the new trait system implementation and that it uses logic programming to model the rules of the trait system. Well, lowering is the name of the process in which Chalk takes each declaration in your program and turns it into logical predicates that are similar to what you saw before. When we're lowering, we can take anything that we know about the program and use it to produce facts and rules just like we did when we were talking about cake and candy. Let's say, for example, that we're compiling a crate called people. The people crate depends on another crate called favorites, which defines a struct, a trait, and implements that trait for any type that implements copy. Both people and favorites implicitly depend on the STD crate, which defines some traits and types of its own. Using the favorite color trait from the favorites crate, People define some of its own implementations of favorite color for its own types. This gives us the complete program shown on the left. Now what Chalk wants to do is it wants to lower this entire program, that means all three crates, into a single logical program made up of facts and rules. There's a whole bunch of facts that we could actually potentially get from this program. For example, uh, we could describe the relationship between the crates and add something like depends on people favorites to talk about how the people crate depends on the, favorite, the favorites crate. Or we could add some clauses like uh, defined in Sanjay people or defined in Manish people to describe how those two structs are defined in the people crate. These are hypothetical, but my point is that you can lower a program into any set of facts that you can derive from it. In reality, Chalk would lower the program into something that looks like this. I've filtered out some of the facts that aren't relevant to what we're about to talk about next, but you can probably see where most of this information is coming from. I mentioned that we're currently compiling the people crate, so the Sanjay and Munish types are local to the current crate. Chalk represents this by lowering these two structs into two facts using the isLocal predicate. We lower the two implementations of the favorite color trait by adding two facts using the implemented predicate. The taco type, which is defined in the crate that the current crate, the people crate, depends on, is an upstream type. We can lower it to represent that uh, with a fact that uses the isUpstream predicate. Notice that each of these predicates represents a concept that we can clearly see in the code. The reason that any of these exist at all is because we decided that they're important and we decided that there's something that we needed to use in order to model whatever we're modeling. We literally could have created any predicates at all based on what's in the program. The final line of this lowered program is probably the most interesting. Uh, there, we create a rule that describes that any type uh, T implements favorite color if T also implements copy. You may not see it perfectly just yet, but it's pretty amazing that we're able to take the Rust code on the left, extract its essence, and put it into the logical representation on the right. 
In the next section of this talk, we're going to see how this allows us to elegantly represent the very complex orphan rules that we described earlier in terms of logic. So there's a lot of details about chalk and the lowering process, which I couldn't get into today. But if you're interested in finding out more, uh, the online Rust-C guide actually has an entire section on the new style trait solving implemented in chalk. OK, so remember all that stuff about the orphan rules? Uh, we're going to bring everything together now and talk about how the orphan check is actually implemented in chalk. Before we start, though, uh, let's quickly do one more example of the orphan rules to make sure that we've definitely got it. Let's say that we have a trait foo, which defines a trait called my trait, and a type foo. We also have the bar trait, which depends on foo and defines its own type bar, as well as an impl of my trait for bar. The orphan check will look at that impl and try to decide if it's valid under the orphan rules. When we compile bar, my trait is considered to be an upstream trait. That means that based on the orphan rules, we have to uh, do some more checking. We can't just implement that type directly. We have to check uh, foo, bar, and then t in order, in order to look for a local type. In this case, the first local type in the bar trait is the bar type. And once we find that, we need to check every type before it to make sure that those types don't contain any of the type parameters of the impl. The term we're going to use uh, for types that don't contain any of the impl type parameters is fully visible. And you'll see why that is in a few minutes. But a fully visible type is made up of types that are completely known to us and can't be filled with some other type later. This is all we need in order to check uh, that this impl is good to go. One important observation here is that any types after the first local type don't actually matter at all, according to the orphan rules. Uh, that means that we can put any type after bar at all, including type parameters, even though we weren't allowed to include those before bar in the order of the type parameters. So now let's talk about how this gets implemented in chalk? Well, the idea is that we create a new predicate called local impl allowed, which describes when a type is allowed to implement a trait under the orphan rules. Then we can go through each type, or, or sorry, then we can go through each impl in our program and ask whether local impl allowed is provable for that impl. If it is, then we can move on but if that isn't provable, we know that the orphan rules have been violated and that we need to produce an error. Here, the turtle type is local. So we know that we can implement display for it. But in the other example, a vector of turtles is not local to the current crate because vec is defined in the STD crate. That means that we can't implement display for a vector of turtles according to the orphan rules. OK, so how do we create uh, local impl allowed? Well, more specifically, we need to ask, what are the lowering rules for local impl allowed? Like, how are we going to lower each trait that we come across in a Rust program? Well, we can figure this out by going through each case of the orphan rules. Uh, let's say that we had this trait with two type parameters. We know, uh, based on which crate the trait comes from, whether that trait is local or if that trait is upstream. If that trait is locally defined in the current crate, we generate a local impl allowed rule that allows any type to be implemented for that trait. This rule says that uh, my trait is allowed to be implemented for any types at all. If the trait is upstream, we need to check those other conditions that we went over earlier. We need at least one local type and for every type before it to be fully visible. The tricky thing here is that uh, we need to somehow find the first local type. We can do that by taking advantage of the fact that during lowering, we know exactly how many type parameters there are in the trait. We can add one rule for every case of where the local type might end up. 
If any of these rules are satisfied, the impl is considered valid under the orphan rules. Now, these rules are basically an exact translation of the English sentence, find the first local type and make sure that each type before it is fully visible. The problem is that we actually haven't defined any of the main parts of that sentence. Like, uh, when is the fully visible predicate actually provable? When is is local provable? We aren't actually finished until we talk about is fully visible and is local. So let's start by talking about is fully visible. This one is pretty straightforward because we really just want to make sure that it isn't provable for types that aren't defined in some crate somewhere. We want it to be provable for all the types we can see, right? That's where visible comes from. But we don't want it to be provable for any of those type parameters. To do that, we can add a fact for every struct in every crate that uses the is fully visible predicate to indicate that it is a type that's fully visible. Since type parameters won't have any such fact, is fully visible won't be provable for those type parameters. We can make sure that is fully visible doesn't allow any type parameters at any level by making sure that we use if and checking that each type parameter of every structure is also fully visible in order for the structure to be fully visible itself. For is local, uh, we just need to take every struct defined in the current crate and lower it into a fact using the is local predicate. In this case, we don't actually care about any of the type parameters that these types may have because a type is local regardless of its type parameters. Notice that I've only added an is local fact for foo because that's the only type in the current crate and bar is an upstream type. So there's a couple of things that I've left out here. For example, I didn't cover how is local interacts with fundamental types. If you don't know what a fundamental type, you can absolutely come up to me afterwards and talk to me about this. Um, and if you'd like to know more about any of this or how it works, you can also come and ask me about that. Uh, but all of this is actually fully implemented in Chalk right now. Uh, Rust-C doesn't actually use Chalk internally just yet, but you can expect that one day your Rust code might be checked with logical queries like the ones I've demonstrated today. The other part of coherence is the overlap check. Uh, this is currently an active area of research in my own work. And just like with the orphan check, my job is to figure out uh, how to model this using logic. The tricky part about the orphan check is uh, what I mentioned before. We need some way to model all possible compatible impulse in the entire universe in order to make sure that you haven't overlapped with an impulse that may be possible to define somewhere else. Uh, I have some ideas about this, but the research is still definitely ongoing. Uh, well, thanks for listening to my talk. We talked about coherence, uh, logic programming, and went over some examples of uh, how we're using logic to model various parts of the Rust trait system. Uh, I definitely wouldn't have been able to do this without the help of a lot of uh, great people, so I just wanted to take a moment to thank uh, Nico, Boats, and the many other uh, awesome people that have helped me figure all this out. Um, thank you. Uh, here's my Twitter and a link to these slides, and I'll be around uh, for questions as well. Uh, qu cool. So I really like the idea of using a, a logic language, a logic programming language to model this. And I'm curious if you feel like, uh, let's say something violates these rules, does it seem feasible to determine, given a violation, turn it into a human readable explanation? Like if I want to understand, you know, why my thing was or wasn't an orphan, and that could be some complex series of visibility rules and so on. Like. Is this something you'll have looked at, or I mean, does it seem feasible to provide some sort of translation layer from, given these rules were violated, turn that into something I could spit out of the compiler? Yeah, so we, we actually already do this, right? So we have uh, coherence checking already implemented in the Rust compiler. It's just not implemented using logic. It's implemented in Rust. And so we already produce error messages like that 
uh, that give you a lot of details and tell you exactly what went wrong. So what will probably end up happening is uh, with this implementation, you'll get enough information back to just know like, oh, okay, this is what went wrong. And then we'll be able to produce the same or better error messages using that. Quick follow-up, I guess I'm just trying to understand, like, say if you changed the rules or added a new rule, like, to what extent is that process just done almost automatically by the, by the fact of the design of your logic programming language? Or is it like you would have to very carefully craft your error messages to each new change to your logic system? Um, no, I think it would, it would work about the same as it does now. So you wouldn't have to necessarily change anything unless you change the orphan rules, right? Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? So I was looking at the um, the coherence definition there, and I am extremely confused by why the the is fully visible uh, predicate only covers all types up to the locally found type. Is there some sort of arcane reason uh, for that that has to do with like what order type inference in this? I mean, I'd assume this already happens when type yeah. inference is all done. Like, why why is why is that? I, is that even necessary, really, or is this just yeah, so I, I mentioned how, you know, these rules kind of seem pretty arbitrary and, and complex, and it's because they really do. Like, that's something that I personally had to grapple with a lot, and it's something I bugged Nico about a lot. But if you read through some of those blog posts that I talked about, uh, they describe the reasoning behind the rules and why they work the way they do. And, and basically the goal is to ensure that every impl can only be, dis uh, can only be implemented in one crate. Right, and so we uh, have to have some sort of local type there because uh, that way you have to use a type in your current crate in order to implement a trait, right? And then as for the ordering requirements, there's also some reasoning behind that that uh, goes towards that goal of only having one place uh, to implement that imp that uh, trait for those types. Does that answer your question? Not quite, but I guess I'll have to be satisfied with that for now since it seems You should arcane. definitely take a look at the resources that I linked to. They go in a lot of detail about this. So while they get, explain that, any other questions or do you have any more questions? No, I'm good. Okay. This is all nice, but like as a normal user of Rust, yeah. I'm a very normal user of Rust, I don't know much. <laughs> as a normal user of Rust, yeah, as a normal user of Rust who actually doesn't know Prolog, how does this impact me? Uh, so, so this impacts you in a couple of ways. So the, the reason that uh, we're talking about uh, logic programming in general uh, is because it gives us a lot of uh, uh, really cool benefits uh, to the implementation of the trait system. So right now, uh, and, and again, I don't know anything about the current implementation of the trait system, but what I've been told is that right now the current implementation of the trait system is sort of ad hoc, and it's, it's, like it's, it's random, it's all over the place, it's very difficult to debug or change or do anything to. And so the idea with this is that we sort of remove uh, that entire layer and just have these logical rules that we can run in a very general uh, you know, logic uh, programming engine, and and then solve. And so, uh, while you as a as a Rust user uh, won't necessarily see the impact uh, right away because this is supposed to be a, a drop-in replacement, what it will do is it will enable us to do cool things like really fast incremental compilation, um, and all kinds of other things that will eventually benefit the users of the Rust compiler quite a bit. Um. I'm curious. You said that it was going to be a drop-in replacement. <clears throat> what are the performance implications, if anything, if any, will so they as, be as far as I know, an overhead? As far as I know, we don't know yet, but it <laughs> should be uh, just as good. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. Perfect. Yeah. We'll have to see. Any other questions? This one over there. Uh, you described chalk as a logic programming language, but you only talked about it in terms of implementing um, a type checker. Yeah. To what extent is chalk a general purpose programming language with things like syntax and compilation? 
versus just being a part of the Rust compiler? And is there any effort being, is there any effort toward turning it into a general purpose language that anybody can use for any purpose? Sorry, I, I should have uh, clarified. Chalk itself is not a logic programming language. Chalk is uh, based off of existing logic programming languages. It's an implementation of an engine that can solve uh, certain queries within a logic programming language. And it's entirely catered towards Rust. So like Chalk has its own syntax, which we use just for testing. It's not actually used with Rust code. And it helps us write uh, tests that sort of look like Rust code. And so you could say that the chalk syntax looks like Rust code, but there really isn't any uh, plans to make chalk into a general purpose language or anything like that. It's just designed to be used to implement, uh, to re-implement uh, the trait system. I've, uh, I've, I've been prodded into asking you whether or not this has any consequences in the realm of this magical thing we've been wanting for a very long time called associated type constructors? Oh, which may or may not have, have something to do with, yes, higher kinded types and, and the magical M word. Are, are you talking about generic associated types and yes, other things yeah. like that? Yeah, so, so yeah, for sure. Like Chalk already supports uh, generic associated types. If you don't know what those are, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> Like, uh, it, it already supports a, a lot of um, really cool extensions to the trait system. And uh, the idea behind uh, doing chalk, um, like itself, is that we can add these sorts of extensions really easily, right? Because it's just a, a couple more rules, it's a, it's a different set of lowering things, right? And so we can actually extend the trait system very easily and start to add these features faster if we have a more principled, well-reasoned uh, implementation of the trait system. There's someone behind you. So I've, I've heard that in Prolog, the, uh, the search strategy for basically resolving predicates is actually fairly constrained by the specification because Prolog involves things like side effects and cuts and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you know if Chalk Engine is somehow more flexible in the kind of search strategy it can use, if you can get any kind of optimizations from that? So uh, right now, our solver isn't actually based off of a Prolog implementation. I think it started that way. Um, there's a, a paper, uh, I forget the exact title, it's in my backpack right there. Uh, it's, uh, I haven't read it, but it's in my backpack right there. <laughs> and, uh, and it talks about uh, uh, something called uh, hereditary HAROP formulas. And so there's, there's a paper, it's called a Proof Procedure for Hereditary HAROP uh, Formulas. And so we use a modified implementation of that. So we probably don't have some of the uh, downsides of a regular Prolog uh, solver because we're not using Prolog directly. Uh, but there are other limitations, like a lot of uh, the research that I have to do next has to do with the impact of negative reasoning, like uh, you know negating a query, putting not in front of it, and uh, what that does, uh, like, like what impact that has on the solver and what it can solve. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, one more. Last one? Or? Yeah, sure, take one. Okay. Can somebody pass okay. along the mic to uh, over there? Uh, so there's currently also an effort to reformulate the borrow checker in terms of logic programming. Um, based on what I, I've seen, it seems like the, uh, the data log engine that it's using is a like a less powerful form of logic than what Chalk is using, mm -hmm. but like, what's the relationship between those two efforts? I have no idea, but so I, I've read the I've read the blog posts uh, that Nico put out, uh, but Nico would definitely be the right person to ask about that stuff. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much.